And in Utah, we have 18 species. And I say, well, maybe up to 20. And the reason we say that is there's a couple of species that we think likely occur here, <clears throat> excuse me, here in Utah, but we've never actually been able to officially document their occurrence. Um, I'm gonna talk later on about how we do surveys for bats. And we use two techniques and one is actually trapping bats and I'll explain how we do that. And the other one is trying to pick up on their echolocation calls um, using specialized microphones. And we have picked up echolocation calls that may or may not belong to some of these bats, but we've never actually been able to actually physically catch these bats in the state of Utah. So uh, we say there's 18 species, but there could be more. Um, and of course, taxonomists love to reclassify everything all the time. So um, at some time, maybe 18 could drop down to 17, um, or we could balloon out to more if we split. Uh, and only if we look at the orders of mammals um, in the world, the only order that has more species is the order of rodentia. So that order that has mammals and mice uh, has more species than we would find in Chiroptera. There's a huge variability. Like you would expect when you have a big broad tax of animals, you're gonna get a lot of variability across the board um, in both size, um, sort of the external morphology of the animal, as well as the ecology and biology of the animal. And so uh, this is a picture of the world's smallest bat on the left is a bumblebee bat. And that's um, a bat that is found kind of in Southeastern Asia. And then um, on the island in the Philippines, we have a golden crown flying fox, which is actually the largest species of bat. And so the smallest species can weigh uh, about two grams. And we actually have some bats here in Utah that we catch um, that are pretty close to that size. They might weigh three or four grams um, to give you an idea on a lot of people don't think in terms of grams here in the United States. Uh, to kind of give you an idea, a nickel weighs about five grams. So a two gram bat weighs about half the weight of a nickel. Um, by comparison, this golden crown flying fox can weigh several pounds. Um, so there's a huge, huge breadth of size difference sort of between these, these two different animals. And then there's kind of everything in between. A lot of the bats, um, these bigger fruit bats, things like that, these flying foxes, we kind of tend to call them uh, mega bats. And then the smaller bats, we, we tend to group into a just kind of a loose group called micro bats. And here in the United States, all of our bats are these micro bats. We do not have any of these flying foxes or fruit bats. Um, and so in Utah, as I'll, I'll talk about when we get to some of the species at the end, um, most of our bats are kind of in that five to you know 30 gram range. So they're not very big. Um, their wings can stretch out and be maybe have a wingspan of about 10 inches, but in terms of actual body size, they're quite small. And then most people, when we do, um, every year I do a, a bat netting down outside of Moab and we do kind of a public bat night and people can come out and see these bats. So when they see them in a the hand, most people are quite surprised uh, by how small these bats actually are. So let's talk a little bit about what bats do uh, in order to survive. So how do, they, how do they reproduce, what do they eat and how do they interact with their environment? And this is just a general conversation about bats. It's not necessarily uh, explicit to Utah, but we will talk about some Utah specifics when we get to it. <clears throat> bats actually have a pretty interesting life cycle. Um, and a lot of people don't realize this, and this is pretty specific to Utah bats and probably most of the bats in the United States. Um, and let's kind of start in this life cycle here. Let's start in the autumn to winter stage. And so it's, because that's where we are now. And so what's taking place in autumn, so when you get into the fall, bats need to either find a place where they're gonna hibernate or they need to migrate. And a lot of people don't realize that we do have quite a few migratory bats, um, as well as bats that actually will find a place to hibernate. Uh, and the place that they, they choose to hibernate, we call a hibernaculum. Here in Utah, I get asked this question a lot. How many bats do we have that migrate and how many bats do we have that actually will hibernate here in Utah? And my answer is always, I don't have a great answer for you because we don't really know. It's actually really hard to track and find where bats tend to go in the winter. Um, obviously there are some bat species we know for sure um, are gonna stick around and there are some that we do know that will migrate. Uh, but there's a lot of bat species that may do a little bit of both. Uh, or we just really have no idea. But what we do know is most of our bat species will tend to actually undergo mating in the fall. And this actually surprises a lot of people. What we, what we see in our bats is they will either go to a place where they are going to hibernate 
or it's going to be a place where they are roosting in the daytime before they actually will go off on migration. And during that time or in the evening, what you tend to get is an aggregation of male and female bats and they'll come out and they'll sort of, uh, there'll be a big collection of these bats. And we tend to, we call that a swarm actually is the name for it. And what's taking place in that swarm is actually mating. And so males will actually mate with the females. Uh, but what does not happen, what a lot of people are surprised about is they don't actually fertilize uh, the egg and the female at that particular time. So the bat will enter into uh, the hibernaculum or it will migrate uh, and they will actually fertilize the egg in the spring. So it's what's called delayed fertilization. So they will mate in the fall, uh, but they won't actually fertilize in the spring. And we actually see this in quite a few different animal groups as well. Um, I did research for a lot of years on rattlesnakes and uh, a lot of rattlesnake species use the same mating uh, system where they will actually mate in the fall and then they will either fertilize the egg in the spring or have what's called delayed implantation where the egg will actually fertilize but it actually won't implant in uh, and, and hatch out until uh, the spring. So it's, it's kind of a pretty unique mating system and it's not really something that most people realize that bats do. Um, in the spring, when the weather starts to warm up, they will either begin to migrate back in if they're migratory species, or they will undergo arousal, which is that process of waking up um, from the hibernaculum that they're in, and then they will uh, emerge out. And at that's the, uh, the time at which we will actually see the fertilization taking place. <clears throat> so that happened in spring. And then usually between spring and kind of that early summer period, we tend to see males and females will, will segregate out and kind of use different daytime roosts or different roosts uh, where they're going to go and spend their time. And so that these are things where if you have a rock, a rock crevice in a, um, in a big cliff face or you have a cave or a mine um, where these bats are going to spend the time of the day when they're going to come out at night, you will tend to see often that you will have segregation with males or a bachelor roost in one place and then you will have a maternity roost which are the, the pregnant females are going to spend their time in one place. Um, some bats are fairly solitary and some will actually group up into large colonies. And it's really dependent upon the species and sort of the, the different families of bats that we have as well. In midsummer or kind of early to midsummer, that's when most bats tend to give birth. And at that time, and most bats, a lot of people don't realize this, but most bats actually give birth to one pup. And so we call uh, a baby bat a pup. And there are some bat species here in Utah that will give birth to two or even four species, uh, or four species, four, four young, four pups. Uh, but we, most of our bat species will only give birth to one pup. And that will take place in summer. And oftentimes the female will go, will leave the young at the roost, at the maternity roost, we will fly out forage, and then they will come back and um, feed their young milk uh, while the young are, are growing. At, about three weeks. And there are some bat species that will actually carry the young with them as well. Um, and those are generally our solitary tree bats will sometimes carry um, their young with them. But the bats that tend to be in these maternity colonies will usually leave their young behind. And uh, after about three to four weeks in the summer, after the, the pups have been born, that's when they become what we use the term volant. And volant just means that they are capable of powered flight at that point. So the young can actually leave, um, can leave the maternity roost and basically go out into the world and, and do their thing. So at that point, there's not going to be any more parental care. Um, they may still return to the same roost sites. Uh, oftentimes we don't know. It's really hard to find these roost sites. And so there's a lot we don't know about bats, but we do have a pretty good understanding about this um, life cycle and the way that, uh, that it takes place, especially here uh, in Utah and, and most of North America with our North American bats. So pretty cool system. Um, and there's a lot that I think people don't quite realize about bats and the, the way that they uh, reproduce, which is pretty cool. I think most people have a pretty good idea on what bats eat, but uh, even here in Utah, I still get calls every once in a while and people claim that we have vampire bats here in Utah, which we don't. Um, so we don't have any blood feeding bats. And uh, we also don't have bats here in Utah that, that eat fruit. But I'm gonna talk about, this is worldwide that we're talking about. So let's talk about some of the things. Here in Utah, our bats are in, uh, they eat insects and other arthropods. And we'll, we'll talk about that in more detail. 
there are bats in the world that are fruit eaters. Um, I, I don't recall the exact story and, and uh, Terry Pope, my counterpart in the central region might uh, remember this a little bit better, but I think there was a hospital in either in somewhere along the Wasatch Front that had some bats that got in there and uh, to try and catch the bats, they actually put out a fruit tray to try and get the bats to come down. Um, that's not going to work here in Utah because our bats are going to eat insects uh, and arthropods. So uh, we do have bats here in the United States and worldwide that are nectar and pollen feeders. Um, none of our bats here in Utah are known to do this exclusively. There has been, uh, I've actually heard of some recent research that there may be some bats that occasionally do this. And we do know that some of our Utah bats may ultimately pollinate some plants uh, by gleaning or catching insects on flowers and then actually catching insects on other flowers. So they may actually transfer pollen that way, but um, none of our bats are, are nectar or pollen feeders here in Utah. Um, there are bats that eat fish, which is uh, pretty cool. I've never seen this in, in, in real life, but uh, I have seen a video of it and it's actually pretty cool to see these, these fish eating bats. Um, and then I mentioned vampire bats and I think this is one of the big myths about bats. Um, there actually, I think there are only three species of vampire bats in the world. And these are bats that are gonna feed exclusively on blood. And one species targets uh, mammals and I think two species target birds. I may have those numbers a little bit off, but um, these are, are exclusively blood feeding bats. They're found um, largely in South America. And uh, these bats will actually come out at night and walk around on the ground. So they actually will use their, their wing uh, fingers and elbows to kind of walk around on the ground. And they have uh, organs that allow them to actually pick up thermal radiation from mammals or their bird counterparts and actually pick up the, the most heat rich areas on there, which are gonna be the most richly supplied areas with blood. And so they can actually then climb onto the bird or onto um, the mammal and they can make an incision with their teeth. Their teeth are, are razor sharp. Uh, oftentimes it's not enough to wake up the mammal or the, or the bird. And then they can actually have a blood meal and feed on, on blood that way. Again, we do not have vampire bats here in Utah or even in the United States, but it's probably one of the more unique and interesting um, ways that bats eat in the world. There are bats that actually eat other bats, which is kind of surprising to a lot of people. And then uh, we do have bats here in Utah that probably occasionally eat uh, other small vertebrates. So they may occasionally catch a lizard or a frog, especially if they're ones that are out at night, um, occasionally catch small mammals and birds. Um, this is probably quite rare here in Utah, but there are definitely species worldwide that do this on a more regular basis. But we do have some species here that are capable of doing this and probably do it uh, on, on occasion. Interestingly, I've actually seen frogs try to eat bats uh, here in Utah. So we have invasive bullfrogs, which are you know quite large frogs. They're from the Eastern United States and they've been uh, introduced into a lot of places in the West. And I've actually had nets set across the water, uh, which I'll talk about how we catch bats. The bats fly into the net. Uh, there's a bat hanging in the net fairly close to the, to the water level. And I've actually had bullfrogs come over and try and eat the bats out of the nets. So it goes both ways too. Um, so our Utah bats, I was talking about this. So what do they eat? So our bats are, exclusively insect, insectivorous, which means that they're gonna eat the arthropods. It doesn't necessarily mean they only eat insects, but they will eat arthropods. So uh, insects, centipedes, scorpions, things like that. So one thing that a lot of people don't realize about our bats is they tend to eat insects and arthropods that are quite large relative to their body size. Um, from an energy standpoint, it doesn't make a lot of sense for these small bats to be flying around catching really small meals. They tend to eat um, big heavy bodied moths, um, beetles that are quite large, um, and then they'll eat a lot of aquatic insects uh, that will have sort of a, a nymphal stage that lives under the water and then it'll hatch out. And, and some of these mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies are, are decent size relative to the bat. So it's, they get a lot of energy for going out and, and catching these, these insects. Um, one thing that our bats probably don't eat a lot of, and I'm always really hesitant to throw this out there because it, one of the, the really big benefits that people think bats do uh, is eat a lot of mosquitoes. And a lot of the evidence showing that bats eat mosquitoes is based on laboratory studies where they've been fed pretty much nothing but mosquitoes. Um, bats 
don't get me wrong, bats definitely will eat mosquitoes in the wild. Um, I've seen it happen. Um, there are some studies in the Midwest where they've seen uh, that there are some bat species that probably are collecting and, and catching and eating large amounts of, of mosquitoes. But um, here in Utah, it's, it's unlikely that our bats are a big uh, element of mosquito control. They probably do eat them, um, but it doesn't give them a lot of energy. And I'm gonna talk about another reason that they probably don't catch a lot of mosquitoes uh, in a little bit. And it has to do with how they find their food and it makes it difficult. Probably the most interesting bat we have though from a foraging standpoint or what they actually eat would be a, a pallid bat. And that's the bat at the bottom of the screen here. And you can see it's carrying a centipede. Um, these bats don't exclusively target uh, terrestrial or, or insects, arthropods that live on the ground but they're very capable of doing it. Um, so they actually can, can land on the ground and kind of like I mentioned with vampire bats, they actually can walk across the ground uh, and target things like scorpions and centipedes. And I've actually seen, it's pretty cool. I've actually seen, especially along uh, sandy stream bottoms at the bottom of some of these canyons, I've actually seen bat prints um, in the ground where they likely have come down, landed on the ground and then walked across the ground to, to collect scorpions and centipedes. This is a pretty common bat here in southeastern Utah as well. I mean, this is, if you ever have a bat that, um, and you are in kind of in southern Utah, I know that we, we do also tend to get them in northern Utah uh, as well, but underneath uh, porch overhangs, things like that, you tend to get these bats, which will actually catch food, fly in there and go in there. We call it sort of a night roost, and that's where they tend to eat their food. And they do collect, um, you know, centipedes, scorpions, and then big beetles as well. And so uh, they're quite messy eaters. So I actually get a lot of calls from Moab uh, where people say, I have, I know I have a bat that's coming in and it's, it's spending the night here. And when I wake up, there's just insect parts everywhere. Um, nine times out of 10, I can pretty much guarantee it's gonna be this pallid bat. And that's really typical of their feeding behavior. They'll catch their, their big prey, they'll fly somewhere and they'll eat it. Uh, and oftentimes the exoskeleton parts, that harder part that they don't necessarily consume kind of gets scattered all over um, the port. Some people like it. Um, some people ask me how to get rid of it, but which is actually probably a good time to mention that all bats here in Utah are protected under law. Um, so you cannot legally um, kill a bat. There are ways to, and if, I, I'm happy to answer questions about that later if we need to. There are ways to deter bats potentially from um, coming underneath overhangs and things like that around houses, but um, they are protected by law here in the state of Utah. And most states have offered bats protection as well. So how do bats eat? So how are they actually catching their prey? Um, one of the primary methods is what we call hawking. And this is actually catching prey on the wing. So the bat's flying around, uh, there is a moth or a beetle that's flying as well. And the bat is going to catch it in midair and then consume it in, in midair. And they do this either by catching it in the mouth. Um, and I actually think one of my favorite behaviors is actually to see them do this. And I've never physically seen it with my eyes, but I've seen video. And I strongly suggest uh, after this presentation that you do a, a search on online to find a video of, of a bat actually catching a moth or a beetle in flight and consuming it. And, and there's some cool videos of them using their tail. And what they actually will do, um, so if the moth is here, the bat will actually fly in and it'll grab it with its tail membrane and sort of flip it up and then grab it with its mouth. Uh, and they also will sometimes do the same thing with their wings. So they'll fly in, grab the prey with their wings and then pull it into their mouth. And it happens uh, in a split second, but it's super cool to be able to watch. Um, I wasn't able to embed the video here. That's why I have video, but uh, I strongly recommend that you watch that. It's pretty cool. We can include it in the follow-up email. Okay. And I'll, I'll, I send you if I I'll can. make a note to remember to put okay. it. Um, and another way that, that bats uh, secure their prey is through a process called gleaning. And I mentioned that some bats are probably capable of pollinating uh, accidentally, and this would be how it would happen. Uh, gleaning is the process of getting uh, insects off of vegetation or uh, other structures. So the bat is capable of, of detecting their prey, and I'll talk a little bit about how they do that on these structures, and typically it's vegetation, the bat will actually fly in and then grab the prey um, using their mouth off of the vegetation. And so um, how do bats find their prey? So we talked about ways that they're gonna catch their prey and consume it, but how do they find it? Um, bats are not blind. 
this is one big myth you hear a lot of times. Um, bats are, are, you know, blind as a bat, but it's, bats actually do have fairly decent eyesight and it will depend on the species and the group of bats. Our fruit bats uh, worldwide actually have a great sense uh, of sight and they actually have ability to see some color as well, which would make sense if you're gonna be detecting uh, fruit and finding fruit. Um, most of our bats though here in Utah have fairly weak eyesight, but they are still capable of seeing and probably catching prey on occasion using their sight. Sound is probably a primary way that they catch their prey using that gleaning method off of vegetation. So bats, they think bats are actually capable of hearing insects um, moving around in vegetation and then coming in and actually grabbing the prey off there. So they have really, really sensitive um, hearing cells where they're able to um, detect uh, very minute sounds that we wouldn't be able to, which leads us into echolocation, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, bats do have the ability to smell. Um, they think that a lot of the fish eating bats probably have the ability to do that as well. I don't really have a good idea of how well our bats here in Utah do smell, um, but they do still have the same sense that we do and uh, likely use that in, in procuring food. And they, bats that are, are uh, nectar and pollen feeders may use that as well for that. But I think one of the, the ways that bats do detect their prey that we are probably all most familiar with, or at least have heard about this, is the process of echolocation. And uh, echolocation is really, and it's there are mammals that do this. We think about cetaceans, so dolphins, whales, things like that have, the, have a, a bulb or an organ in their head. They can send out these high-pitched um, frequencies that will then bounce off of things. And bats have a similar ability to do this. Um, but it's even more evolved and more refined than we get in other animals. And so this was first detected um, by a biologist at, um, I believe it was Harvard University, did his graduate work on this back in the, in the 30s. And essentially what the process of echolocation, what happens is in the larynx, so in the voice box, bats are able to produce a very high pitched frequency that they then can send out um, through their mouth um, sometimes there are some bats that will send it out through uh, the nasal cavity as well, but most of the bats will send it out through their larynx and their mouth. That high pitched sound uh, is emitted from the bat. It will then reflect off of either a structure uh, or more likely their prey, uh, return to the bat and based on the return um, interval, how fast it does and a few other characteristics of it, bats are then able to really sense their environment and find their food. And so this is, uh, the primary way that probably most of our Utah bats will actually um, find and secure their food and actually offers us as biologists a really cool way to be able to look for and identify bats that I'll talk about in a minute as well. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about echolocation though. Um, so these bats are going to emit this high frequency pulse and what we find is different bat species will emit different uh, frequencies of pulses. And even the same species of bat can vary uh, what we call the wavelength or that frequency. When you are talking about a high pitched sound um, leaving from a bat, the shorter the wavelength, um, and so you can see this picture of wavelength down there, so kind of the tighter those, those waves are, um, the higher the frequency is going to be and the better that is going to be for detecting smaller objects. So bats that are going to be um, moving around in vegetation, uh, some of our smaller bats who are going to be looking for smaller prey typically have higher frequencies or that shorter wavelength. One of the downsides to that, though, is that tends to attenuate quickly. What attenuation means is basically that that sound dies off much quicker than um, longer wavelengths or lower frequencies. And this kind of is, lies at the crux of another reason that uh, probably a lot of our bats generally don't eat mosquitoes. The mosquitoes are very small. Um, in order to detect smaller objects, you have to have a very high frequency pulse that is leaving the bat. Uh, and it's very difficult for a lot of bats to probably be able to detect mosquitoes when they're flying around. Um, so it's, it's probably when bats do eat mosquitoes, it's probably a bit more opportunistic when they're flying around, maybe they can detect them by hearing. Um, or if they do pick them up by echolocation, it's, it's probably a little bit more infrequent. And, and this probably only occurs in some of our bat species that have higher frequency calls. Um, 
And when I say calls, it's kind of like if you think about a bird um, singing or having a call, we tend to see the same thing in bats. Uh, bat species tend to have sort of a characteristic frequency that they echolocate at. Um, as I mentioned, they can change that. So if a bat is flying in open air, um, oftentimes they will lower their frequency. Um, so have longer wavelengths because they don't need to detect the smaller objects. But when they drop down into vegetation and looking for prey, they oftentimes will shift their frequency higher. Um, and then I mentioned, uh, I just mentioned this, the longer wavelengths, the lower frequencies are good for those open air flying bats. So we have some, some bat species, especially um, some of our free-tailed bats tend to do this. And I'll talk about some of those in a bit. Um, they tend to fly at higher elevation and they tend to fly uh, oftentimes more in straight lines. And so that lower frequency uh, echolocation call tends to be um, better for, for doing that. And, and, and like I said, they can shift their, their frequencies up and down. Um, but this lower frequency, longer wavelength call will tend to carry a lot farther, which does give them um, a much better ability to navigate using echolocation than you would get with these shorter wavelengths. One thing I don't think a lot of people realize is the volume at which bats um, can actually echolocate at. They have uh, detected that bats can echolocate up to 160 decibels in volume. To give you an idea, a chainsaw is 110 decibels, uh, rock concerts are usually about 120, and a shotgun blast is 160 decibels. So if you think about it, bats are flying around uh, emitting these pulses, sometimes up to 160 decibels, probably over 100 decibels. It's quite loud. Um, fortunately uh, for us, we can't really hear above about 20 um, kilohertz. And so it makes it, um, it makes it difficult for us to be able to hear it, which is probably a good thing. And as I mentioned, the higher frequency calls tend to attenuate really quickly. So they don't carry very far, but very close to the front of that mouth, uh, echolocation calls are going to be very, very loud. And so here in Utah and, and probably worldwide, our bats tend to echolocate um, from a little bit less than 10 kilohertz um, up to about 100 kilohertz. Um, and some bat species can probably echolocate a little bit higher. And the kilohertz is uh, a measure of that wavelength. And so the higher the, the, the number of kilohertz, the more higher the, higher the frequency the call is, um, the lower the lower the frequency. And so I just mentioned humans can hear up to about 20 kilohertz and dogs can hear up to 45 kilohertz, which presents an interesting question I've often wondered, which is, uh, can dogs actually hear bats flying around a bit more than we can? And so if they can, uh, if you have a dog that ever goes crazy out in your backyard at night, um, I don't know if it has anything to do with this. I've often, I don't know if the call attenuates too fast and they can't hear it, um, but I do often wonder if bats can hear or if dogs can hear bats. Uh, a lot, lot better than we can out in the environment. Um, we do have, because we can hear at about 20 kilohertz and below, and we have bats that echo locate at about 10 kilohertz, there are quite a few bat species that we can hear um, just flying around. And a lot of bat species, as I mentioned, can lower that frequency of echolocation. So it is very possible for us to hear bats flying around at night, and we often do uh, in the summertime. Especially here uh, in Southern Utah, we have quite a few species of bats that echo locate at lower frequency calls. And so uh, you can hear that pretty regularly. A couple other really cool bat facts kind of before we get into um, a few other areas. Most bats do enter what we call a daily torpor. And this can, can a, day, a torpor is essentially a, a shortened hibernation. So it's a way for bats to lower their metabolic rate. And, and this can occur um, for a, a variety of reasons. And it typically occurs when environmental factors are fairly extreme. So if temperatures get too high or they get too low, um, in order to reduce their metabolic rate so that they don't use a lot of energy, um, bats can actually drop their body temperature um, quite, quite a bit. From about 40 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, um, they can actually lower their body temperature. And the result of doing this is to actually reduce their energy expenditure by um, about 50 to 99%. So it's a, it's a really significant way to be able to deal with these extreme environmental conditions. As biologists, when we're studying bats, um, we do need to be conscious of this if we're catching bats in colder environments or colder climates. Um, bats can be active in relatively cold weather. Uh, when we have them in the hand, sometimes we, uh, it is possible for a bat to go into torpor because it's not moving around and it uh, it's, needs to lower its energy expenditure to deal with it. So, when that happens, we need to warm the bats up before we let them go. So this torpor can be a, a fairly big thing. 
Um, I've seen bats that will enter torpor in, in very hot temperatures. And uh, I worked in California for a lot of years and we had a, a workshop that was outside and we would occasionally get bats that would enter um, into some of the crevices on the side of the workshop and they would go into torpor in the daytime. And if you, uh, if the bat woke up or you woke the bat up, oftentimes they were just like, if we've been sleeping all day, fairly groggy and oftentimes will fall down to the ground. It doesn't mean the bat's sick. It doesn't mean that um, there's anything necessarily wrong with the bat. It's just waking up out of that torpor and bats can be really vulnerable at that time. So um, that's one of the reasons we need to be really careful with bats uh, when they have entered into torpor. I mentioned bats are not blind. Uh, I mentioned that the mega bats, the fruit bats have excellent vision and our micro bats generally have fairly poor vision. They use it for traveling, um, but probably don't use it for catching food uh, very often. And I, I alluded to this a little bit earlier. Uh, I talked about frogs occasionally being bat predators. We, there are uh, quite a few other um, species of, of, or groups of animals that will um, consume bats. We know uh, owls will do it on occasionally. There are raptors, so uh, some of the hawks, especially if bats come out earlier in the daytime, uh, we, we see uh, things like Cooper's hawks will, excuse me, will sometimes grab them. Uh, there are snakes that will target bats. They'll actually hang outside of a, of a cave structure or a mine and actually um, target bats as they're coming out. Um, there are actually alligators and crocodiles that will do it as bats come in to, to get water. They will actually come out and grab bats at that time if they're capable of doing it. So bats have a lot of uh, predators, but being nocturnal animals, so flying around at night, again, our fruit bats worldwide are, are oftentimes active more in the daytime, but the micro bats come out at night and those are gonna be the ones um, that hopefully, you know, the, in doing so, we'll be able to avoid a lot of these predators that are coming out at night. But they certainly do have predators that can still get to them. Um, I mentioned the bullfrog thing a little bit earlier. Uh, just like a lot of mammals, they can be host to external and internal parasites. Um, and I think one of the coolest parasites, I, I think this is so cool. A lot of people think this is horribly gross, but I'm going to talk about it anyway. Um, this is actually something called a bat fly. And it is a true fly. So it is in uh, the order Diptera, which is uh, where our house flies are from. Most of bat flies are completely wingless. There are some that do have some vestigial wings and some that will actually lose their wings over time. Uh, but these ectoparasites, so parasites that stay on the outside of the bat, uh, feed on the bat's blood and will spend almost their entire life living on the bat. They look like spiders, but they have six legs, just like other insects do. Uh, when we catch bats in the hand, if they have these on there, you'll actually see them running around in the fur. Um, kind of gross, but it's actually pretty cool. And one thing that's I think is super cool about this is that um, their life cycle for the bat fly is kind of neat too. So these bats will often return to um, a communal roost. So you may have multiple bats in an area. When it's time to reproduce, they actually will leave the bat. Um, they'll mate and then they will lay one just one egg, most of them. Um, in in the colony or in that um, communal roost, and then they'll immediately climb back onto their host bat. Uh, and then they actually, um, when, the, when the egg hatches, it's very, it, it's larval stage is very short, and then they will immediately kind of uh, undergo the process of turning into these adults and then move right back onto the bats. So pretty cool evolutionary um, thing that has taken place with these bat flies to be able to live on bats. So. Um, I think it's cool. Some people think it's gross. I always like catching a bat that has it on them. Uh, and they're, they're, some of them are pretty good, pretty good size. You can see there's a picture of a bat on the right side that has the bat fly on its head. Uh, again, these are micro bats, so they're fairly small, but still, still kind of cool. Uh, and then probably one of the other big things we hear about bats a lot is that they can be reservoirs for zoonotic diseases. We heard about with COVID, there was a talk that that may have, have originated in, in bats. Um, some of that's up for debate, but the one that, that isn't, uh, we do know that bats can be just like every mammal can be reservoirs for rabies. Um, and that's probably one of the things we hear about the most. And here in Utah, um, the, the rabies strain that is by far the most prevalent is uh, the, the strain of rabies that can be found in bats. Uh, it can occasionally be found in other animals as well, but it likely has originated in bats. Um, the thing to keep in mind though, is all bats do not carry rabies. And this is um, 
something that it's it's hard to drive home to the public and probably one of the reasons that people don't like bats is they associate them almost exclusively with rabies. It's very hard to test a bat and to get a good idea of how prevalent rabies is in the environment because in order to do that you have to kill the bat uh, and the brain tissue has to be sampled. So it's not something we can easily do. Uh, we don't want to just go out and, and catch a bunch of bats and just kill them to test the rabies. Um, there have been some studies that have done that in different parts of the United States. And what they found is that um, the, the prevalence of rabies in wild bats, so bats that are just out free flying around in the environment, have not been caught by people and taken into a lab, is probably less than about 1%. So it's, it's probably safe to say that, you know, one, two or 3% of all the bats flying around in the environment uh, have rabies and the rest of them don't. Just because one bat in a colony has rabies, they've done tests on that, uh, it does not mean that every other bat in a colony is going to be rabid. Um, bats that have been turned into labs, specifically because they have gone into a house, have bitten somebody, have had some strange behavior, they test um, positive for rabies at a rate of about 15%, ones that have been turned into a lab. Uh, but again, that's not a wild situation. Those are bats that have um, been acting strangely and have been turned into a lab specifically to be tested. For that said, even though rabies uh, prevalence in bats is very low uh, in the environment, if a bat, if you come in contact with a bat, uh, we always recommend that people immediately contact uh, a medical professional just because uh, of animals in here in Utah, they are one of the more likely ones to carry rabies, even though it's not a very common thing. Um, Another uh, disease, or it's a fungal disease that is not affecting humans that bats can transmit to us, but it is something that is affecting bats, and you've probably heard of this, uh, is something called white nose syndrome. And this is a fungal disease that is spread bat to bat, and it is spread most likely uh, when they're at the, the hibernaculum. So when these bats are hibernating, and it is, has really affected some of our Eastern bats, um, and basically this fungal disease will grow on the outside of a bat and it will cause the bat um, to leave hibernation early and move out into the environment much sooner than it would normally. And it's that process, that process of waking the bat up and sending it out into the environment in the winter that actually results in the bat's death. And we've seen deaths of millions of bats, again, mostly in the Eastern United States. Uh, we do not, as of yet, uh, have any bats that have tested positive for white nose syndrome here in Utah. Uh, there are bats in most of our adjacent states that have tested positive. It's likely that white nose syndrome will ultimately wind up here in Utah, but we don't know to what degree that will affect our Utah bats. Um, the reason for that, a lot of our bats don't hibernate communally. Uh, a lot of our bats may only use, um, you know, rock fissures or uh, mines where they are in smaller numbers, so they may not have the same uh, degree of transmission from bat to bat. Also, we're in a much drier environment. We don't know that the fungus is going to persist in the environment to the same degree. There's a lot of questions we don't know the answers to. Um, we're hoping that when it does get here, and I say when because most likely it's going to, uh, we're hoping that we don't see the same effect that we've seen on some of our eastern bats. Um, and it's not 100% fatal. Bats, if they can survive um, leaving the hibernaculum that they're in, they can actually clean the fungus off. Um, by the time you get to midsummer, even if a bat has had white nose syndrome, it most likely will not present any of the symptoms or um, have any of the fungus on it anymore. Um, so it's not 100% fatal, but when it does get into, into the environment where we have a lot of bats, it it's, can really decimate a bat population. So I'm gonna talk quickly about ways that we can actually do surveys for bats. Uh, I see we're at 6.50, so I'll try and wrap up here pretty quickly. Um, I, I say it's all about water, and I say luckily we're here in the arid west. And what I mean by that is we don't have a lot of water, and that makes it easier than in some environments to catch bats. And the reason for that is bat metabolism is so high that when they leave uh, the roost site to move out into the environment, they, they need to drink fairly constantly throughout the night. And oftentimes when they come out of torpor, one of the first things they do is drink. And so we know where bats are going to be. They're going to be congregated around water, plus their food source oftentimes is around water as well. 
And so if we're gonna catch bats using nets, um, we can do that around water sources. And then we can also use microphones, which pick up their echolocation calls. And we can set those around water. Um, to catch bats, we use something called mist nets. And if anyone's ever done bird work, uh, where you put bands on birds, they're very similar to that. These are nets that are very fine. Uh, we can set them over water or around water. And when the bats come in, these nets have been closed, so they look a little bit, um, they're easier to see, but when they're open, they're almost invisible to the eye. And the hope is that the bat has come into the water in the past. They're not gonna be echolocating because they can pick up the nets using echolocation. Um, and hopefully they're gonna come in, they will sort of be on autopilot and then they'll fly and uh, towards the water source and get caught in the nets. And then we can go remove the bats from the nets, identify the bats, take any measurements that we need to, uh, and then release the bat hopefully unharmed. And then the other way that we can survey for bats, uh, which is a little bit less precise because there is a lot of overlap in echolocation calls in bats, we can pick up their echolocation calls using high frequency acoustic equipment that will pick up these um, ultrasonic calls that bats are putting out. Um, and then we can run it through software, which will allow us to see uh, these sonographs of the bat calls. And it will, um, based on certain characteristics, how quickly they're emitting these pulses, uh, how much they drop the frequency of their pulse in a specific call, um, the main frequency of the pulse, all of these characteristics can then be matched up with certain bat species. And so we can get a good idea of what bat species are flying around in the environment. Um, this is a much less invasive method for surveying for bats, uh, but it is a little bit less precise. So we oftentimes will do both. We'll oftentimes have acoustic detectors set out. Uh, and then to augment that, we will also be netting bats as well. And that will help us get a good, uh, a good sample of what bat species are present in the environment. Um, I'm all, I wanna make sure we have time for questions, but I just really quickly wanna show a few of our Utah bats, especially some of the ones that are a little bit more interesting and then we'll- we don't have any questions in the chat yet. Okay. So okay. Um, I feel like you're good to go. For those of you out there, if you do have questions, maybe start typing them in the chat or do a raise hand okay. um, and then we'll go. So talk, touch on that quickly and then I have one raise hand since we've Sure, it. sure, no problem. Um, one of the more common bat species here in the United States, and, and I think it's it's actually one of our, our cooler bats uh, is what we call the Brazilian free tail bat. It's called a free tail. You can see in the picture of the, the person holding the bat with gloves. Uh, almost looks like a mouse tail. It's their tail is very free; doesn't have as much membrane around it. Um, this these bats are are really cool. This is the one that uh, in Bracken Cave in Texas, where you've seen the video of thousands and thousands of bats coming up. Those are Brazilian free tails, so they can be found in the highest concentrations of mammals in the world, uh, which is pretty cool. And they're very strong flyers. Um, in fact, it is. There's a little bit of debate about this, but um, most people generally, the general consensus is that the fastest um, straight line distance for any mammal in the world uh, recorded has come from one of these animals. Um, and it's at about 100 miles an hour is what they've determined that they've, they're capable of flying um, at about that speed. I doubt they're flying around at 100 miles an hour on a regular basis. Um, and we do know that like peregrine falcons can do what's called stooping, where they will drop down and dive uh, at speeds of over 200 miles an hour. but um, in terms of powered flight, they think that this is actually the, the, the fastest flyer um, in the world at speeds, like I said, of, of over 100 miles an hour. And so really cool bat, um, big wrinkly ears. And they actually have a really specific smell. So if you've ever gone into a place where uh, there are Brazilian free tails, some people think it stinks. It doesn't probably doesn't smell that great, but, um, but they do have a very distinctive smell. I mentioned this bat earlier. This is a pallet bat. Um, so one of our larger bats, they actually, you can see in that picture, it has quite a large wingspan. Um, if you get a lactating female, so oftentimes we'll catch, uh, when we catch females in the nets, uh, if it's at the right time of year and they have pups and they're lactating, I think their main, just like if you were a human, you wanna get back to your babies. I think oftentimes they, they wanna do that. You can get some pretty cranky pallid bats um, and they can give you a pretty good bite. You can see that teeth, their teeth there um, in that one picture, they, they're capable of, of biting through the leather gloves that you can see in this picture. Um, nowadays, because of white nose syndrome, we typically don't just wear leather gloves. We'll actually have um, nitrile gloves on over that as well. So some of these pictures are a little bit older. Um, so we do have a bit more uh, safety precautions in terms of white nose syndrome. Um, and these are the bats that I mentioned can land on the ground and actually 
collect and take prey fairly large. Um, so things like lizards and rodents, but will oftentimes eat, uh, you know, uh, scorpions, centipedes, things like that. So it's definitely one of our cooler bats. Very pig-like looking face. I, I really like these guys. They're, they're definitely one of my favorite and they have a very blonde coloration. So um, I think by far our most beautiful bat is the hoary bat. And it's the second largest bat we have here in Utah. Again, they can have wingspans of about 15 inches. Um, and their, their body mass is, is quite large. You can get these guys up to you know, 40 grams or so, fairly large in size. Um, and they, they're very capable travelers. Um, they can travel fairly large distances. Um, and we do know these guys to be migrators. So they are, in the, the winter, they're gonna be moving uh, fairly long distances. This is the only bat that is found in uh, in Hawaii. So we do know that they were capable at one time. The, the species in Hawaii has been, I think, classified as a, as a different species of hoary bat, or at least a different subspecies. Um, if somebody knows differently, they can correct me. But um, that is a, a, it is still a hoary bat, though, and they're definitely related to the ones that are found here. So they definitely have abilities to travel long distances. These are fairly solitary bats. Um, they're almost never found in pairs, and they tend to roost in trees. So they spend their time, um, these are, are what we call our tree bats. And this, these are the ones I mentioned that can have uh, multiple pups, not just one. And you see they have that kind of frosted fur and you can see on the face here, uh, very yellow uh, appearance of their face and then that kind of frosty color on their fur. Definitely, I think my favorite bat for sure. Um, they do a really cool thing when they're in the net. It's kind of terrifying if you haven't really worked with bats before. Um, they can kind of vibrate their whole body and hiss at you. Um, so if you're getting one out of a net, it's, it can be a little bit intimidating, for sure. Um, then we have uh, some groups of bats that we kind of call our big-eared bats, big-eared bats. Um, Townsend's is, is one of them. Uh, these guys are almost exclusively moth eaters. They're fairly decent in size, um, but they're considerably smaller than, than the other two bats I just showed you. Um, and these are largely in Utah, especially associated with mines. We have a lot of abandoned mines here in Utah, uh, and it's believed that a lot of our Townsend's big eared bats are, are found in mines. There are some caves. We don't have a lot of caves here in Utah, but the ones that we do have, um, we do find Townsend's big eared bats in those. And they're not considered to be um, long distance migrators. You can see here's a little small group of them in a cave. Um, and, and I'll probably, I may go one more bat beyond this, but this is, uh, in addition to the hoary bat, this one's one of our more rare bats. Uh, a lot of biologists have never seen these bats. We hear them, uh, we pick up their echolocation calls. They have a very low frequency call. It's, they usually transmit at about eight kilohertz. Um, and they're, they're fairly high flyers. We know they're in rough, rocky terrain when they come out, but they will travel long distances. Uh, and this is the spotted bat, and it is, probably the one bat that anybody would be able to identify. Um, big pink ears, black body, and those big white spots. And it's, it's one of North America's least known animals just because we don't, they're probably fairly common, but we just don't have, uh, we don't catch them very often. And so it's hard for us to know a lot about, about this animal. Uh, and bats are not an easy animal to put transmitters on and follow them around. And so it's just, it's, it's an animal we don't know a ton about, but uh, we do have them here in uh, southern Utah. Uh, we know that they've been found around the Vernal area as well. They're probably not necessarily found out in the West Desert, um, but uh, we do know they, they exist in, in a lot of the state. And then the rest of the slides are going to show you bats that all look fairly similar, so I'm not going to kind of go through each of them. Uh, but these are sort of the, the, uh, the big brown bat, and then we have a lot of Myotis bat species. And Myotis is the genus name for these bats. Um, and big brown is not a myotis, but it looks very similar to our myotis bats. And these ones are much more difficult to identify when we catch them in hand. Um, oftentimes we have to use different uh, dichotomous keys or keys to be able to go through and look at uh, wing measurements. We have to look at ear measurements. Um, the tragus, which is sort of that outer part of your ear there at the front, bats have big, um, bigger short traguses or they're blunt or they're pointed. Um, so these are all things we have to do. Uh, to identify some of these bat species. Uh, big brown bats especially are fairly associated with humans. They're probably our most cosmopolitan of bats, so they're ones that are found fairly regularly in, um, in city environments, and they're a fairly generalist species. So 
Um, there's probably one of the more common species. If you're if you see bats, they're fairly large flying around a billboard, something like that in a city. Um, there's a good chance that you're looking at a big brown bat. And I'm, I'm, I think I'll stop here. Um, I don't need to go through all 18 species of bats because <laughs> they all start to kind of look up. You can see if I'm kind of flipping. Oh, I should talk about this one really quick. This is one of our smaller <laughs> bats. Uh, they're adorable. This is, I almost, if people come out bat netting with me, I can almost guarantee we're going to catch one of these um, because the one of the more active bats in the early evening, uh, and this is the canyon bat. And it's one of our smallest bat species. And you can get a good idea of how small this bat is just by looking at, at it in comparison to somebody's fingers. Um, and, and so I like to catch this one early and show people because they're immediately shocked at just how small they are. Uh, super cool. I really like these guys. And I don't think I've ever met anybody who, who didn't think they were cute, even if they didn't like bats. So. They're so cute. The I actually was searching through our shared files and I found like our swanner files from ages ago and i found a that's what the photo for this event was was from it seemed like a canyon bat that had been caught during an event yeah. <laughs> and we have other and you can see i mean as i'm kind of flipping through there are other bats that look very similar that are quite small um but the canyon bats in general are are super cute so cool all um, right so well, yeah with that i'll take questions if we have them and uh, whatever amount of time we have so sure thanks scott that was awesome um we're at seven now but we will ask a few questions noah hopefully you're able to hop stay on for a few minutes um i'll ask the raised hand question first um so tatiana i'm gonna allow you to hop on um and you can unmute yourself or do whatever makes sense for you thank you Hi, Scott. Um, Hi. I love bats so much. I went to the Swanner exhibit and they had Egyptian fruit bats. Uh -huh. um, and they're so cute. I love bats. They're so misunderstood. Um, I'm not a scientist. My degree is in French. But if you do you have any need for like an intern or someone to help you? I don't live in a house, so I can't build like a bat house but I did see like a small brown bat at an apartment I was living at about like two or three years ago. Uh -huh. And so I would love to contribute in some way to preserving the bats of Utah, preserving the bats everywhere. Bats, like you said, are on every continent except, you know, Antarctica and they're endangered and people think bats are weird and gross, but they're not, they're super cute and they're the only mammals who can fly so I would love to help do more to protect the bats in Utah or study them or I just want to help you because <laughs> sure. I um, love bats. And so um, we don't often use uh, volunteers for a lot of our bat work because it's um, it's pretty specialized, especially handling bats. Uh, we've all been vaccinated with rabies or for rabies, I should say. With, <laughs> oh, that is the, I guess <laughs> technically you are vaccinated with rabies. But um there are some citizen science or some uh community science projects that that do use uh volunteers uh sageland collaborative which is a used to be uh wild utah uh i think they will i i'm not sure if they're doing any bet projects right now terry pope and cody wallace who are on um, may have more information about that uh, than i would but uh, there's something called the north american um any bat which uh is a, a project where they're looking at using echolocation calls um there might be ways to get involved more with that um if you do a search for na bat so it's literally na like north american uh bat project uh you might be able to find a bit more information about getting involved that way or contacting um sageland collaborative is one that i would think uh might be able to kind of point you in the direction for being able to help out but a lot of the uh, actual handling and trapping of bats takes place um it's pretty specialized work. And so we, we do a lot of public nights where we'll actually do that with people, but um, we typically don't use volunteers for that kind of work. But there is uh, probably opportunities using the acoustics um, that I mentioned for, for working with bats. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tatiana. Um, and thanks, Scott. I, Cody and Terry, I can shoot you an email after this too and just get some info about if there is anything that you recommend or 
or how to get involved, that'd be awesome. And then we can include that in the follow-up. Um, we have a question from Ellen that uh, is, have bats evolved much over the years or have they looked like this for thousands slash millions of years? Um, I mean, there's been an evolution in there. Uh, you can trace bats back fairly, fairly far um, and they have looked pretty similar. But um, one thing that has probably shaped the bat, the, the, I'm trying to think of the right word, that has shaped sort of the, the group or the assemblage of bats that we have worldwide has been um, the emergence of diseases like white nose. Um, we've probably seen some bat species blink out over time as a result of that and other bat species that have been more adaptable um, have been able to persist. We think it came from Europe uh, and, and Asia. And so we probably have seen uh, bat assemblages change there. But as far as bats, um, from what we've been able to look at in you know, fossil records and things like that, we bats have looked fairly similar, although there's probably been uh, evolution within their echolocation systems and things like that um, that have changed over time. But, um, but by and large, I think evolutionarily bats are, are bats. I think we've probably seen some changes over time, but, um, but yeah, within the, the records of what we know, Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Scott. Um, okay. And then Sally asks, how with echolocation does the bat differentiate prey from uh, the local environment, such as rocks, trees, plants, etc.? I don't have a great answer for that because I can't echolocate. Um, <laughs> but I would I would venture to guess that it has to do with movement. Um, as the bat's flying around, you're getting a moving signal. Uh, so if a moth is flying away from it you're getting uh, the echolocation call is bouncing back at different intervals based on, on the movement of the animal. Um, whereas on static objects like trees and walls, you're not getting um, the movement that occurs. So it's probably largely movement based. So if you had an insect that's sitting on a leaf and it's not moving at all, it may or may not be able to differentiate that. That said, it may be able to, bats probably have the ability to look at shapes of things based on how the echolocation call returns and they may be able to pick up prey that way as well. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks. We've, I've definitely noticed, so as part of the Soar with Bats exhibit that's at Swanner, we have 10 uh, Egyptian fruit bats and they are fruit bats. So obviously their eyesight is pretty great and they definitely know when we're there, are paying a lot of attention to what we're bringing in and what's happening. And so it's been really fun to interact with them and see their curiosity. Um, and then, uh, Noah, this is actually a question for you. Uh, Ellen is wondering if you can show us what the symbol for bat is. Yeah, so a lot of people will fingerspell it with. Oh, I think you're muted. Yeah, so they'll do like bat like this, which. Or sometimes people just spell bat. Okay, so. thanks. I appreciate that. Um, I think that those are all of the questions that we had. If you have one second, I have one question just about um, has white nose syndrome, do you think that white nose syndrome has increased because loss of, does loss of habitat have an impact on the spread of white nose? Like are, are bats hibernating more together if they're losing habitat areas? That's a good question and, and there may, be some kind of analyses that have been done on that, especially in the East. Um, I, there's, a, there's a lot of factors that would tie into that. Um, the, a lot of bats are fairly, um, show fairly tight fidelity to spots where they hibernate. And so uh, they're gonna be returning year in and year out, especially where places where they've been hit by white nose the most, cave structures. A lot of bats show a lot of fidelity to that. Um, so the degree to which bats are likely to switch hibernation sites would largely play into that. Um, so in bats that may be more likely to move um, from one hibernaculum to another that are also susceptible to white nose syndrome, um, it stands to reason that you could see uh, an increase in white nose syndrome as a result of habitat destruction. More than likely though, you would probably see uh, in terms of habitat destruction uh, of, of because, because white nose syndrome takes place at the hibernation sites, um, the destruction would have to take place 
uh, at the hibernation site in order to make a difference. And because a lot of bats show a lot of fidelity to those sites, um, to the degree to which uh, habitat destruction would, or habitat loss would factor into white nose, I don't have a great answer. My guess is it wouldn't increase it uh, by a ton. What could happen though is uh, through habitat loss, you that's another stressor on the environment and bats that are susceptible to white nose likely need to come out into a healthy environment where there are lots of insects, where there is a good foraging availability. So loss of habitat could certainly affect mortality. Um, as far as affecting the spread of white nose, I'm not, I don't have a great answer for you. Okay. But I would imagine because anytime you, you decrease habitat quality, um, that's another stressor on, on an animal. And so uh, anything that's gonna increase stress on white nose syndrome uh, infected bats is gonna be a negative, so. That makes a lot of sense. Well, thank you so much, Scott, for your time. Noah, thank you for your time. Um, thank you to everyone for joining us. I threw the survey in the chat. There's a, um, a link there. If so, for those of you participating, if you have a moment to fill it out, that would be awesome. Should just take a minute or so. Um, and then if you'd like to see the Soar with Bats exhibit at the Eco Center, it's open through January 8th. Um, this Friday and next Friday, we're actually doing extended hours. So we'll op be open until 6 p.m. on Friday night. So if you'd like to see the bats eating and moving around a little bit more, it's a great time to do that. Um, other than that, we're open 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Wednesday through Friday. So um, there's cultural artifacts in the exhibit. There are live bats in the exhibit, and there's lots of information about um, their impacts on our environment. So it's a great way to learn about it. Scott, I've learned so much tonight. Thank you for joining us, and uh, I appreciate all of you. Have a great night. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it.